Today, again, we don't know if it's the same day, but probably not. We have a second topic with uh, Brian Kaplan, which is with, with Ypsilon. Why is your name with Ypsilon? Is it a normal, where, is it a standard that there is a, because we usually make a mistake, it's a Brian with I, but you are Brian with, with Ypsilon, no? In a, in uh, a you mean, mean A? Uh, no, I or, mean, or, or uh, Y, sorry. Y, 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 y yeah. Y, Y, or what you, you say Ypsilon? You say Ypsilon, yeah, oh, really? <laughs> sorry, oh, <okay. laughs> it's Y. <laughs> Uh, there, the story is my mom was Irish, my dad wasn't, and my mom felt that somehow Brian with a Y was less Irish and so was a better compromise name. <laughs> um, it has made it made my life harder for like, 22 years of having it misspelled all the time. Although now that I'm an author, it's much better because it means that when people Google my correct spelling, they always get me instead of a much larger number of people with the same name with the standard spelling. Yeah, that, that makes sense. But so it means... Uh, you are of Irish ancestry. Um, so my yeah, so my mom. So yeah, my my dad is you know, you know, from you know, descended from Ashkenazi Jews in Poland and Latvia, from what I've been told. So it opens our topic of uh, mm -hmm. immigration, <laughs> mm -hmm. which is uh, once again very very hot in Slovakia. Uh, you have a book, Open Borders, and I will sum it very quickly. You are in favor of completely open borders yes, and immigration am. because. Uh, because, well, let's see, what's the best way of putting it? I mean, two reasons. So for, you know, first, I think that it should be the default unless we have some good reason not to. And, you know, so you know, like telling someone that just because they're born in a country, they are forced to go and live and work there for their entire lives seems like a terrible thing to do to someone. If you had a really good reason, like you would avoid a plague, then all right, fine. I guess that it's unfair, but we're going to do this. But more importantly, what I say is, You know, not only is you know, migration restrictions the kind of thing that you would need a really good reason for, but when we look at the social science, we actually see there's a fantastic reason against restricting migration because my, migration is actually overall really good for humanity, not just for the migrants, but for people around the world. The most important economic argument in favor of free migration is also one that hardly anyone ever makes, but I focus on it in the book. The most important argument for migration is this. When a human being moves from a poor country to a rich country, obviously their motive is to get a better job to make more money for themselves. But that's not the only effect. Why? Because the reason why wages are higher in some places than others is because worker productivity is higher in some places than others. When a Mexican farmer moves to the United States, he doesn't just get a raise, he also produces a lot more food because U.S. agribusiness is much more productive than Mexican traditional farming. All right. What this means is that moving people from poor countries, rich countries, doesn't just enrich the migrant, it enriches humanity by increasing human productivity. It doesn't just move people from one place to another, it actually increases total production. When people measure how much total production rises or would rise as a result of open borders, the estimates are astronomical. The largest estimated economic gains of any economic policy reform, at least since the collapse of communism, probably even larger than that, in fact. Right? And it comes down to this. There's an enormous number of people want to move. At least a billion people on Earth would like to move to another country to work. The gain per worker would normally be something like multiplying their productivity five times. So we're talking about, at minimum, taking a billion people and multiplying their productivity fivefold, which means is a, there's a gain of 4x of their current productivity to humanity. That is the fundamental economic case. Probably in the long run, you'd actually see even more migrants, which is why when people are doing the math, a very common round number answer is to say that open borders would double the production of humanity, right? It would double a GWP, gross world product, a statistic that we rarely discuss, but it's, of course, it's the, would be, if we did discuss it, it would be the biggest statistic of all because GWP adds the GDP of all countries. What we're talking about then is an opportunity to drastically, radically increase the production of the world by letting human talent move from places where its productivity is low to places where its productivity is high. Right? And uh, really what I wind up saying is whatever the other effects of immigration are, I talk about those as well, these economic benefits are so massive 
that even if you were to go and accept very pessimistic views on the other effects of immigration, it's still a fantastic net idea overall. There is one but in my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, Only one. That's e yeah, you're easy. One major. One major. Okay. <laughs> uh, can do this all day. Can it be the case that a massive immigration into a country where the system enables them to produce more mm -hmm. uh, wouldn't change the system itself mm -hmm. and lower the productivity mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. the host country? Mm -hmm. Logically, it's absolutely possible. Most obvious, you know, like the simplest one would be if the immigrants come in and start a civil war. This brings us back to the empirical question of how likely is that? Do we have any good examples of that? What I'll say is we have almost no such examples. Normally what happens is when the first generation of migrants come in, they're highly apolitical. They don't make much effort at all to change the system. They're just trying to find a job and take care of their kids. Then when their kids grow up in that country, they generally assimilate to a very high degree, which means that they are not destabilizing the system at all. Uh, if you were to push me and say, like, what are the best counterexamples where immigration actually did either come close to or actually lead to disastrous effects, I will say you know, like the you know, Palestinian migration into Jordan almost caused a civil war. And then when Jordan expelled them into Lebanon, it did cause a civil war. And you know, this is a very special case where the immigrants are immediately a large percentage of the population. And also they have, they are like, they're like a, an unusually large number of them are very excited about having some horrible political change, like seizing the government and then attacking Israel, which, you know, would not have, which would have just led to even further disaster. So, I mean, the, you know, the, but again, like these are, these are cases where it, logically it's possible There's a few examples, but again, it really has almost nothing to do with actual migration. Actual migration normally is a much smaller percentage of the population. It doesn't happen overnight. Right? And of course, immigrants usually are apolitical. They're not interested in tra transforming the country they're in. They're interested in, in, in finding a life for themselves. Uh When people are talking about um, immigration here in my mm -hmm. country, they are usually worried not about uh, some uh, civil wars or this mm -hmm. kind of scenario, mm -hmm. but they are worrying about scenarios like, for example, in uh, France or mm -hmm. in Western Europe, where some kind of ghettos were created and there, are, mm -hmm. there is problems with crimes and these kind of uh, mm -hmm. problems. What would you say to mm -hmm. these kind of people that... Uh, can yeah. So t two things. One is that... Media depictions are grossly exaggerated and should not be relied upon by anyone for anything. Right? If you want to understand what's going on, calm down, turn off the news, and read boring statistics, which will then give you a better view of what's going on. Sometimes you'll find, all right, the news is, an enti is not entirely wrong, but it's just overstating it. What the news does, and this is just a general complaint about news, it's not specific to immigration, is they just try to find the most horrifying, dramatic, emotionally affecting things and show everyone to ruin everyone's day. That is what the whole media industry is based on. Again, it not, does not mean that what they're saying is, is, are, are lies. It's just that they're totally unrepresentative. They're trying to show you the worst possible thing. If there is one immigrant who goes and murders one person, that will be on the news. You're not going to have news stories about a million immigrants who didn't murder anyone. You're not going to have stories about immigrants who are just living their lives and doing well or sending money home to their relatives and saving them from hunger. Right? These are not the kinds of things the media coverage so covers. So to say that media depictions are extremely unrealistically negative does not mean that everything is perfect all the time. That's not true either. But it just means that if you want to think about these issues, step one is to forget everything the media told you because they are trying to make you paranoid. And instead, calm down, look at actual numbers. In terms of actual numbers, what I'll say is that uh, in, the US, in the U.S., immigrants actually have lower crime rates than natives. Although this does not mean that we don't have a bunch of media just like yours saying how terrible immigrant crime is. Immigrants have lower crime rates than natives. That's very clear in the data. And yet this doesn't mean the media was going to say things are fine. All right. Um, so anyway, what I'll say there is, you know, like, of course, you know, you know violent crime, property crime is a problem. But um, immigrants have this problem to a lower degree than natives. So it's really hard to see what the complaint is. Uh, for Europe, uh, yeah, it normally is true that immigrants have higher crime rates than native-born Europeans do. There, what I would say is just worth putting in perspective, uh, European, native-born Europeans have incredibly low violent crime rates, right? Compared to the U.S., there's almost no violent crime here. You can have double that rate, and it's still not very much, right? Um, 
does not. So you checked country. the yes. stats yeah. before mm-hmm. you came here, yeah, right? Uh, <laughs> so not for Slovakia, not for Slovakia. I know. Yeah, but it's yeah, very low. Yes, but yes. Um, you know, like you know, the general picture is that Americans are highly violent and Europeans are barely violent at all, which means that immigrants are better than us, but worse than you in terms of crime. But again, like, like I say, the best thing to do is just to step back and say, yes, remember I was talking about doubling GWP, enormous economic benefits. If we just put a reasonable value on these losses from crime, then again, it's just, it's just so small compared to the economic gains. It really does not make sense to have any important change in policy. And if you say we're going to be more careful in doing criminal background check, then I'll say, fine, that's no big deal, unless it becomes an excuse for just saying no. Then in terms of ghettos, Mm -hmm. um, this is one where, on the one hand, you can go and say, you know, 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 immigrants don't want to work. On the other hand, you can say, well, the European welfare state makes it easy not to work. Which one should we actually blame? Well, I'll say that if, uh, if welfare benefits either didn't exist or if they just ended after a short time period... The idea that immigrants would just stay in your country and starve to death is totally unrealistic. They would find jobs, and one of the best ways to assimilate is to work. Work is the best engine of assimilation. So if you do have a problem with assimilation, don't just casually say, immigrants don't want to work. Look at your welfare state and say, wait, are we actually giving people incentives not to work? And let's stop doing that. Which, again, does not mean even that you have to change your own welfare state. You could just say that non-EU citizens have different eligibility for benefits. You can come to Slovakia to work. You can't come here to be a parasite off of taxpayers. I think, what, especially in Eastern Europe, what we see is that uh, people are extremely sensitive uh, to cultural differences. Mm-hmm. I mean, f- six, f- five, six years ago, uh, there was an immigrant crisis uh, because of Syrian and Libyan mm-hmm. immigrants and partly other African immigrants. And we are talking about maybe hundreds or low thousands uh, yeah. trying to get to the Central Europe and to Slovakia, mostly only as a transitory country. And there was like huge backlash against mm-hmm. against this. Mm-hmm. Now we have the Ukrainian crisis. Uh, within less than a month, 250,000 Ukrainians came to Slovakia. We, ha- we are 5 million mm-hmm. countries, so it's 5% mm-hmm. of, the, uh, mm-hmm. of our citizens in uh, 30 days. That's like what, 15 millions in uh, United States within a month of yeah. Mexicans or whoever. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's, it's unprecedented number. Mm-hmm. Yet, for now, uh, the Ukrainian refugees are completely welcome, mm-hmm. well-treated, and very well accepted in Slovakia. And what I believe, or how I read it, that the cultural difference that the Ukrainians have a very similar language, there are many connections through works and mm-hmm. through families and friends, uh, our view on the on Ukrainian immigrants is completely different from the Syrian, and nobody really considers their economic impact or maybe even the crime. Probably the the, mm-hmm. the fear of crime is behind those those mm-hmm. cultural differences, but uh, seeing somebody as a uh, similar to us is is a big mm-hmm. game changer for at least in, in Europe which, or Eastern Europe. What I would say here is that. There is an enormous gap between people's political views and their personal views, right? And what I mean by this is that someone might say, yes, like I'm very culturally averse to people from the Middle East, and they'll vote for a party to go and make sure that you have Slovakia for the Slovakians. This does not generally mean that they would actually do anything personally about it. If immigrants moved in their neighborhood, would they move to a new area? And, and you know, I think you mentioned my first book, The Myth of the Rational Voter. This is a good example of a general problem with politics, that politics is based upon what people say rather than what they do. You can easily get people to vote to say, no, immigrants are absolutely terrible because they're culturally different. We can't possibly deal with them. Yet when you actually see what happens when someone is dealing with immigrants every day is they actually rarely have any serious problem with them. Right now, so you know, like you know, here I often think about an interview that I did with Andrew Sullivan, a uh, you know, famous British podcaster. So he was talking about his brother. So this is me imitating Andrew Sullivan, imitating his brother. He goes, <laughs> Andrew, London's not England anymore. All right. So the point of this complaint is that because of all the immigrants into London, it doesn't feel like London anymore. And what I said is, look, if your brother really cared so much about it, he would move to a low immigration part of the United Kingdom. He didn't. Therefore, I say this is mostly just rhetoric and he doesn't actually care that much. And honestly, I think this is what's going on all over Eastern European as well. There's a lot of rhetoric of being opposed to people from other cultures. 
I think in practice, actually, the odds that people in Eastern Europe would really move to another neighborhood if there were a few, a few Middle Easterners there, I think is very low. Um, and so I think a lot, a lot of what's going on is it's just, you know, once again, showing how democracy doesn't work. Democracy appeals to emotional and symbolic views that people have rather than to practical realities. I don't think it's actually true that people's cultural version is anywhere near as strong as you would think just from looking at the political angle because politics is there to amplify the symbolic and emotional attitudes that people have rather than to say, let's see what, you know, let's put your money, put, put your money where your mouth is, see whether you actually are willing to change your behavior for this. You know, another example of this is someone who says, oh, my religion's my most important thing to me. It's like, well, you never go to church, so what are you talking about? Right? Actions speak louder than words. Right? Yeah. It's not polite, but it is insightful to realize this. Now, that said, in terms of philanthropy, then I think that cult you know, cultural difference is a big deal. So I think the amount of philanthropy that you have for Ukrainians is much higher than the amount of philanthropy that you ever would have had for people from the Middle East. Think that people from the Middle East, if they were here, you know, they would like you know, if uh, you know, like in the absence of philanthropy, if your government was supporting them, they would just take low-skilled jobs, which were a big improvement for compared to what they had before, and they would be you know self-supporting and working here. There'd probably be a lot of complaining about them, but not a lot of actual action. But democracy basically takes people's worst impulses and makes them into a reality. Uh, so you know, like th things that otherwise would just be cheap talk actually become national policy through this mechanism. Let's see, so, uh, you know, I guess, you know, there are definitely some Americans who are actually angry at you guys by say, saying, look, the fact you're taking all these Ukrainians shows what terrible racists you are. You know, I think that's uh, unfair, at least in the sense of, well, at least they took in a lot of Ukrainians, right? You know, like, like you're, like you're going to go and complain about this. You know, like, and again, for philanthropy as opposed to basic rights, I would say there's also, like, it's one thing to say someone's from a different culture, so I'm not going to respect the right to get to, to take a job from one employer, which I say that is terrible. On the other end, to say, look, I don't, I don't identify this much, so I'm not going to give it. I'm not going to go and support them charitably. I'm going to support. I'm going to spend my charity on people that I feel good about. Say, so, you know, that's just basic human, you know, you know, the way human beings, you know, basic, you know, human compassion. Where, yeah, you like, you spend more money on your kids or your or your broader family, or cause or your your local church. And again, to go and complain people complain about that really is just getting to complaining about almost all actual charity. And of course, it's motivated by an emotional connection when you're going and giving money to strangers for free. Um, so, I mean, like, I am overall amazed by how much charity there has been in Eastern Europe towards Ukrainians. I mean, I'm honestly also shocked by the government policies, but I will claim one kind of indication. Namely, it shows that everyone who said we can't do it was just wrong. You can do it. It's just, you know, like, the question is, we don't find, we don't want to. This is another one of my pet peeves is people say we can't when, the, when what they really mean is we don't want to, right? You know, like any, oh, I can't do my homework. No, you don't want to do your homework. You can, you are capable. It is within your ability to do it, but you don't feel like doing it, right? Why do you say you can't when you don't want to? Well, can't is a defensive move. It's like, well, look, don't blame me. It's just beyond my abilities. I can't lift 10,000 pounds above my head. It's like, well, what we've seen here is that when countries actually want to go and take in 5% of the population in a couple of weeks, it is completely doable. It is well within your abilities. So to say that open borders is simply infeasible, say, no, it's totally feasible. If you're going to object, object honestly and just say, yeah, it can be done. It's not going to be a disaster. I don't feel like it. We will see in a month or two how <laughs> this situation develops. Mm -hmm. Do you have another question? Or? Not me. You are very silent this, uh, yeah. during this part. Yeah, yes, but I have one question, which sure. is a little bit off topic, so I mm -hmm. uh, let it in the end. And it's, it's somehow related, because immigration is about uh, increasing uh, productive people mm -hmm. in country. And there is uh, also another way how to increase productive people in the country. It's increasing fertility rate. Mm -hmm. And it's a really big topic in Poland, which you visited, mm. and also oh, yeah. in Hungary. Mm. And also our politicians in Slovakia want to increase this fertility rate, and they want to use some uh, subsidies and uh, social programs for young family. So I would like to know what's your stance on this, uh, polit mm -hmm. o o on this policy, mm. you know? Right. So two things. So as a social scientist, there's the question of, do these policies even work? It's hard to judge this because normally countries only adopt pronatal policies when their birth rates are falling. Then you look at the birth rate and you say, oh, it kept falling, the policy didn't work. Well, maybe it would have fallen even faster if you hadn't had the policy, so it's actually hard. 
Unfortunately, there are actually a couple of very good experiments that I talk about in my book, Selfish Reasons to Have More Kids. What these experiments show very strongly is that pronatal policies do work. L uh, large financial incentives will actually lead to a, uh, you know, lead the birth rate to be a lot higher than it otherwise would be. In fact, the effect is so large that some, uh, that's, uh, when we go and look at two things, we look at the responsiveness of childbearing with respect to policy and also estimates of the future taxes that a baby will eventually pay. When you put those two together, it looks like pronatal policies are the holy grail of tax policy. But I mean, these are policies that in the long run more than pay for themselves. The tax cut actually gives the government more taxes in the long run rather than less because the tax cut gives you more people, the more people pay more taxes, and therefore it pays off. In terms of what policies are wise here, you know, I think the best ones are ones where you give tax reductions for having kids rather than just paying equal, equal amounts of money to everyone. This way you particularly encourage people who are married couples who are going to be supporting their own kids. You also encourage higher birth rates among people who are statistically likely to pay a lot of taxes and to be high contributors. The policy in Hungary where if a woman has four kids, she pays no, ta no income taxes for the rest of her life. I think that's just about the ideal kind of policy because this is giving very strong incentives to high productivity women to have more kids which will statistically lead to the production of more high productivity kids who will be especially productive members of society. So I think that is an especially uh, good approach. But yeah, like, you know, you know, but generally these kinds of policies probably do more than pay for themselves. Uh, it's worth pointing out that, you know, so usually the responsiveness of married women to these policies is higher than unmarried women because at least in the United States, uh, about 75% of births within marriage are planned and about 75% of births outside of marriage are not planned. And there's higher responsiveness of incentives to uh, when, when you are planning versus when you're not planning. Um, so that's, that's my quick version. Brian Kaplan has a, a speech today at six, which you have missed because we are watching it after <laughs> the speech. So we, we will cut this yeah. short. Uh, so he has some time to prepare. Just to remind, uh, the Open Borders is also in a Czech version. And we haven't mentioned it, but actually it's a comics. Yeah, so... Even your kids even can read. Even, 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 even if you yes. don't like to read. It's, it's a non-fiction graphic novel, and it's the only one that kids, uh, only one of my books that kids have ever stolen from their parents to read. So I'm very proud of that. I mean, so, it work. I mean, I'll say, like, I, it's very, I, I consider it very well-researched and well-documented. People who are world's leading research specialists have gotten value out of it, but so have their five-year-old kids. Everyone in that whole range can enjoy something out of this book. So we hope you read the book or at least check the pictures. Mm -hmm. And it was very nice having you here. Thank My, you very my much pleasure. For thanks thanks so much.